Hey everybody, welcome to Brave. If you're a guest with us or it's your first time, my name is Samuel Laws. I have the honor of serving as our lead pastor and I wanna welcome you at all of our campuses from San Ramon, San Francisco, Dublin. Hey, thanks for joining us. Great to have you with us. Uh, but today I'm gonna to introduce you to a guest speaker and uh, he's a guest, but he's not a guest because this is his home church. But let me tell you a little bit about him. His name is Neil Sullivan and he works for the Table Group with Patrick Lencioni. And Neil has 25 years of corporate and nonprofit experience helping CEOs, executive teams. He's just a great leader, uh, very wise, but also I just gotta share with you just the incredible resume of some of the stuff he's done. He is a Bay Area resident, but he was also a firefighter, a UC Berkeley graduate, a CEO, leadership coach, and an international competitive open water swimmer. And I, I hear he's like swam across the whole bay, which is pretty crazy. I was like from Alcatraz, it's like, like Neil could escape from Alcatraz. Let me just say that with that kind of resume, you could escape from Alcatraz. Okay, but hey, he's gonna be talking today about the importance and the value of trust in relationships. And I know uh, it's gonna encourage you, but also uh, challenge all of us and help us grow. So let's welcome Neil as he comes. It's great to be here. I wanna, I wanna just, um... Welcome to campuses, San Francisco. Uh, the first time I was at Brave San Francisco was the cleanup day, and I was just there last week uh, doing the worship night, and man, I love what you've done with the place. It looks amazing. Actually, a lot of this message that I'm gonna share today uh, was written in San Francisco that day, so great to be there. Brave San Ramon, just love you guys. That's actually the first Brave Church that we attended and the last time I was speaking on stage at Brave San Ramon, I was actually delivering the eulogy for my sister. And it was such compassion, such care, such support that was given to our family during that time from Pastor Josh and others. And really, really thank you. If you're listening online today or some point in time, welcome. And Brave Dublin, great to be here with you all. Uh, this is actually the first church that Tracy and I attended when we got married. We moved to San Ramon, we came to this church. Obviously it wasn't in this building, it was over there uh, in the student center now, but it's just great to be here. And when I was talking with Pastor Darren and Pastor Samuel about what would you like me to speak about today? You know, are you in a theme or in a series or what might you like me to talk about? They said, hey, you know, we know what you do and can you share what you do and how God has used it and what the impact is? And I said, that's no problem. So as Patrick Samuel mentioned, I do, I do work with Patrick Lincioni um, and the table group. And basically what we do is we help teams be more effective. And Pat is the one that's written all these books, Death, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, The Advantage, Death by Meeting, all these books. And I am a principal consultant with them. And so work around the world with leadership teams. And um, we work with all kinds of entities. We work with Apple and Google and Microsoft. We work with small local companies, schools like this, churches, all kinds, anywhere people are trying to do something together, we can help them do it better. I work, my world is kind of like from the, from the surreal to sublime, okay? I work with the top hundreds of executives in the, um, in the U.S. nuclear weapons program, uh, and hypersonics and counterintelligence and space and all that. That's one end of the spectrum, all the way to the people who count the Kardashians' money and in the middle of the Britney Spears stuff. <laughs> Anywhere, every time. So that's what I do with half my life. The other half of my life is I run a large international ministry for pastors and nonprofit executives around the world. And what we do is we basically create these peer groups. And what we really do is we create safe places for kingdom leaders to do life and ministry together in authentic ways with people who understand their world and can speak into it. And we do this in the U.S., we do this in Haiti, we do it in Kenya, a bunch of African countries, Mexico, Canada, Cambodia, all over the place. And actually, that's how I met Pastor Darren. And he and Samuel were in one of these groups that I led. And at the same time, um, Pastor Roger Belsey was in one of these groups. And if you take 
Fast Track, which I took a couple weeks ago, which is great, Pastor Samuel shares a little bit about the history of Brave, and obviously a big part of that history is the connection between Brave San Ramon and Brave Dublin, and he talks about Pastor, that he and Pastor Roger were at lunch, and there was this other guy there that had to go deal with a boat. Well, I was that guy, okay? <laughs> and so I left, and I left them to their own device, and so you can blame me, I guess, you know. <laughs> but it's just been a, it's just a blessing to be part of Brave here. And again, as they said, just tell us what we do and how God's had impact in that. Basically, I share this message with executive teams all all around the world. And that is the theme for today, and that is authentic leadership, authentic living. Authentic leadership and authentic living. And they're, they're really one and the same, okay? Uh, Pastor Samuel mentioned a couple weeks ago when he was kicking off the Daniel series that leadership is influence. Leadership is influence, and I agree. And that sort of defines us all as leaders, right? We all have influence, whether it's at work, maybe you have a big title like a CEO, or maybe you're showing up at work and you're influencing the people around you. At school, in our neighborhoods, in our families, if you have influence, which we all do, you are a leader. And that influence can be good and bad, right? But we all have influence in our lives. I have a saying that I kind of landed on a while ago, and that is, leadership is always the issue. Whether an organization is successful or not, leadership is the issue. And the issue is usually the leader. <laughs> and the leader's issue is usually something internal to them, right? They may be insecure or have ego or pride or abuse or um, worried about their image or whatever it might be. And so what we do in these groups and what I do with these executive teams is we just try to get real and say, okay, what is, what's going on that is causing you to not reach the fullest potential for you. And that's the same with us, right? I mean, if we're all leaders, we need to ask ourselves, what's going on that's keeping us from being fully authentic with, with others in our life? It was like Adam and Eve. You know, Adam and Eve were in the garden, right? They had influence over all creation. They were the first ones there. They did the one thing God said, hey, don't do that. And then all of a sudden, what did they do? They hid, right? They covered themselves up. They masked. And then God, you know, kind of ironic, I guess, he's, he's calling out, where are you? Where are you? He just created creation. Not like he doesn't know where they are, right? And so they said, hey, we're here. We're hiding. And you know what? We've been hiding from God and from each other ever since, right? We put on these masks with each other. I do work with, um, you know, this national security world, and, and I work with one team, which is the executive team, the highest level team in the whole thing. These are absolutely the smartest people in the world in their field. They are literally the smartest people in the world in their field. And it's not like they can't figure out how to read a book from Patrick Lachoni, right, or do a meeting. But I've worked with them for seven quarters in a row now. And it always comes down to what is going on inside. What are the behaviors going on within a team and within a leader themselves that limit, limit the potential that they are able to achieve? We do this exercise at the end of a couple-day offsite, and it's the most powerful thing we do. And I call it, we call it something official, I call it Live 360, okay? And what we do at the end is we, we go around and in the room with everybody around the table, it's basically they're saying, hey, Neil, or whoever the leader is, here's something that you do that really benefits this team or this organization. Keep that up. But also, here's something that you do that's kind of tripping us up. And we'd like it if you did a little less or a little more of that, okay? Differently, obviously. It's, it, as you could imagine, as I kind of do the preamble to this in a room with a bunch of leaders, the anxiety level goes up. But they dive in, they do it, and it's the most powerful thing because it's probably one of the first times they've ever had an authentic conversation with people that really know them about what's really going on. What would it be like if you went uh, to work tomorrow and said, hey, or maybe your neighborhood this afternoon, or maybe even home tonight, you know, said, hey, here's all the things you're doing great. Here's all the things you're not doing great, right? It would be an interesting experience. But it's all built on trust. It's all built on trust. And 
when I started in ministry, when I came out of school, I worked about 12 years in full-time ministry, and I started in campus ministry, high school campus ministry. And I took this group, it was about 25 students, and I worked with them for a year, and I just poured myself into them. I, you know, went on trips, and I did everything I could think of to just invest in these, these students, right? And I grew that group all the way down to 12, right? It was not a great experience. And so I thought that summer, I said, I got to do something different here. And so I grabbed some friends of mine and who also were believers and, and enjoyed youth ministry. I said, hey, you got to help me in this. And not just with the activities, but you've got to tell me what's working and what's not working and what I'm doing and what I'm not doing that's working. So we started doing it. Every Monday night, we started working, you know, doing the program. Then we'd go to one of these people's house, and they would just, you know, tear me up one side, tear me down the other. You know, we'd share it with each other, but I was the leader, so I, I needed to hear most of it. And during that year, that group did grow. It grew to a point where 10% of the school was at that weekly meeting every Monday night. And when we did an, a, an event, up to 50% of the school was there. And we did this one Christmas carol thing where all the kids were at the school, and then we started singing, and we were three blocks away, and there were still students at the school, and the neighbors were calling the police because they thought it was a riot. You know. But that all happened because God was able to use people that were authentic with each other and had the best interest in each, for each other. And the question is, do I really trust God and others with me? Do I really trust God and others with me? Enough that I'm going to let myself be that vulnerable, that authentic with them. I have this, um, this, this little module, if you will, that I share with all the executive teams after a period of time of working with them. And I call it the humility to transformation pathway. Okay, the humility to transformation pathway. And um, because it, it, it's like this, I have, I do, uh, internet, I do open water competitive swimming. I've swam from every point of land to every point of land in San Francisco Bay, to Alcatraz and Angel Island, Tiburon across the Golden Gate and all that. And I have these three swim coaches in my life. One was a uh, master swim coach, a big master's team, another is an open water coach in Hawaii, and one was like a mental coach, uh, uh, ex-Olympian, and Paul Kingsman's his name. He's great. He's a keynote speaker, and he'll do this message where he'll pull out his Olympic medals, right, and he'll hold them up, and he'll say, everybody wants to wear one of these, right? Don't, don't you, like, when you see the Olympics and you think about being on that podium and leaning over and putting a medal on that, that'd be awesome. But then he pulls out of his other back pocket his Speedo <laughs> and says, but nobody wants to wear one of these, right? meaning nobody wants to do the work to get the, the reward, right? And so this humility to transformation pathway, we'll, I'll talk to a CEO and said, hey, yeah, what we do is we work with leaders to help them transform their teams and their organizations. And they're like, awesome, you can transform my organization? And, um, or they, maybe they read Pat's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And if you write a, a business book and spell maybe 30, 50,000 copies of it, that's a pretty good run, right? Well, Pat wrote that book literally 20 years ago, and it has sold up to 5,000 copies a week, every week for 20 years. It just struck a chord with the world. And so some CEO will be in an airport, pick up the book, read it, say, that's my team, call us up, can you work with my team? And say, yeah, absolutely. But I've got a book for you to read. And it was actually Pat's first book, Five Dysfunctions was the second book. And it's called The Five Temptations of a CEO. Right? And so what are the one or two or three things that we do as leaders that trip our teams up? And I run this big international nonprofit, and I do all kinds of things to trip our team up. Right? And so I give it to a leader. I don't really care which of those five they come back with. I, you know, it might be interesting. But really what I'm testing is how vulnerable are they? How humble are they? Do they actually see anything in themselves about this? I only had one guy kind of actually literally throw it back across the table to me after you read it. I said, I don't see myself in any of these. I was thinking to myself, that's almost worse than all of them, <laughs> right? Because this humility is the key to this humility to transformation pathway. Jim Collins, the great writer of Good to Great and all that, is, um, talks about a level five leader, and that is fully humble and fully expert. 
So we start with humility. When you have humility as a leader or as a person, you're basically saying, you know, I'm not the best swimmer in the world. I need three coaches. Or I'm not the best husband in the world. Or I'm not the best friend or work or whatever. There's something in me that, that needs to change. Then you're able to be vulnerable, okay? So you go from humility to vulnerability, meaning, hey, you know what? I've got some challenges. I need some help. Will you watch me? Will you coach me? Will you tell me what's going on? Will you have my back like that group of youth ministers that I worked with? When you have that, you can get uh, feedback from those individuals. When you're vulnerable and invited, you can get feedback from it. And then you go ahead and do the work, right? You got to do the work or else you're wasting everybody's time. And in that work, others can help you be accountable to that work. Others can't really hold you accountable. They hear about accountability partners, accountability groups, all that. It's actually you need to submit yourself into accountability. And in that loop, as you do that loop, that leads to transformation, right? So that's the humility to transformation pathway. And it's the same way in our lives. If we aren't willing to be humble and vulnerable and seek feedback, we will never reach the fullest potential of who we are, of who God has created us to be and what he's created us to do. There's two, uh, I call them the ultimate dysfunctions of the team. They're not in that book. If they were, they'd be like at the back, like the teacher's edition, right? And the first one is self-protection, and the second one is self-promotion, right? Self-protection and self-promotion. The challenge is they're very, very natural for us as human beings. Oftentimes, that's how we get to be leaders, right? I want to keep my job. I want to feed my family, so I'll protect myself, or I... I want that next best opportunity, so I'll promote myself. But when we do that, oftentimes we're saying something or not saying something, or doing something or not doing something to manipulate that impression, right? Kind of masking up, Instagramming up, Facebooking up. We're only showing out, you know, the, the, two, the, the best sides of us, right? In Proverbs 18.1 says... One who separates himself seeks his own desire. Another way to think about that, one who isolates and thinks they have it all together and has no problems, has no, needs no input from anybody else, kind of lives in their own world, their own ideas, and that's about as far as they get. He quarrels against all sound wisdom, kind of rejects everything out there. See, I don't think anybody was created well-rounded. I don't think any of us have everything we need to do everything we've been called to do. Right? I think we've been created interdependent, where we need each other. We need each other's spiritual gifts. We need each other's abilities. We need each other's caring. We need each other to, to watch our back for us to really achieve our fullest potential. But rather, it's like we have two resumes, right? We have this one resume we put up on LinkedIn. It's like, here's the jobs I've had. Here's the school I went to. Here's, you know, all the certificates I have, and look how great I am. And then there's this other resume we don't put up there, <laughs> like what really happened. Right? Like, I've been the CEO of something, but I've been fired a bunch of times, right? I do have a boat where we take leaders and leadership teams out on, but I sunk the last boat. It took me forever to go through school, right? We never put any of that up there. We just kind of live in these masks. We live in these masks. The thing to know is that you're not alone in that. I'm not alone in that. We all kind of do that, right? We all live in these images, or, or maybe even imposter syndrome, or or, or needs that we have that we're not expressing. You're not alone, so don't do it alone, okay? Don't do it alone. You can only uh, progress with other people. And I know Brave Groups are on hiatus right now, but this fall, if you're not in the community in this church, Brave Groups are the way to do it. Get in community, connect in the fall, and I'm going to share with you uh, what my concept of an ultra-brave group Okay. Now, Pastor Samuel and Dan Darren are probably watching this somewhere and thinking, oh my God, we're starting new programs. But no problem. Just a small group, just, just a few people, okay? Because, 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 because our core need, our core desires as human beings is to be fully known and fully loved, right? We just desire in our core to be fully known and fully loved. I share this with corporations. I might change that love word in certain settings to accepted. Fully known and fully accepted. 
Because what's going on in, in our minds is, you know, you guys accept me. But I'm thinking in the back of my mind, if you really knew me, if you really know what I've done, if you really know how I act, if you really know what I think, you'd be heading for the hills. But I don't share any of that because I need to be loved and accepted. So I mask up, right? I only share the, the safe parts of, of my life. But when we are able to be authentic with other human beings and be fully known, we can be fully loved. The oddest thing about this is that the more vulnerable you are, the more people run to you, the more they connect to you. It's like, oh my gosh, thank you for being real, and gives them the permission and safety to do the same. And it is the closest we can get to experiencing here on earth God's unconditional love and acceptance, right? It's the closest we can get, is to be fully known by at least one, two, three people and still fully loved in that. And it, and it kind of prompts the question, have you ever told anyone everything? Have you ever told anyone everything? Have you ever been that authentic? Have you ever been that vulnerable with anyone? Now, you can't do that at scale. You can't do that, you know, with a, a big group. But you can do it with one or two or three people, and thus, an ultra-brave group, right? Just to be able to go there and say, this is really it. This is really what's going on. I spent about two years in a cohort with an author by the name of Bill Thrall, who's one of the authors of a book called The Cure. And... Um, it was all about living life with masks, essentially, which is especially hard, by the way, for pastors and leaders, right? They are really challenged by having to live with a mask or choosing to live with a mask. And the question it continues to be, am I trusting God and others with me? Do I really trust that? Do I really trust it? Because the truth is this. We are not sinners who are trying to behave well enough to get to God, right? We're not, we're, we're not sinners or, or people who have done things to separate God, ourselves from God who now we're just going to behave our way to God and be good enough to earn his love. Because if that was the case, we're basically rendering what Jesus did on the cross useless. It's like, Jesus, that's okay, but I can get to God because I can just behave well enough. That's not who we are. Who we really are are saints. If you've accepted the love of Jesus as the Lord and Savior, you're, we are saints who sin, right? We're saints who sin, so let's just be real about it with at least a couple people, and let's just live that authentic, authentic life. I don't know if the book The Cure went up there, but if you're interested in that book, um, check it out. There it is, and it's a, it's a great book, short book, right? Romans 5.8 says this, that God demonstrates his own love towards us in this. In that while we were still sinners, and let me just kind of paraphrase this a little bit. It also kind of means while we were yet sinning. And let me take that a little further. While we're sinning right now, you and me, while we're doing things that separate us from God right now, Christ died for us. Christ gave that ultimate sacrifice of love and acceptance to us. The desire is, the need is to come home to that unconditional love to come home to that unconditional love and acceptance. You know, there's a story in, in Luke um, 15, 20 through 24, that is the story of the prodigal son, right? It's always called that. It's always called the prodigal son. But that's not really the, uh, the story. It's a story of the loving father. It's a story of a loving father welcoming his son, this prodigal son who took all the money and who lived a crazy partying life and lived in literally a pigsty and, and said things and made decisions, finally wakes up one day and says, this is not working for me. I'm going to have to go confess to my father what I've been doing 
and beg for his forgiveness, and I'll just live off the scraps of the servants. And so we pick it up in verse 20. It says, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, and his father obviously hadn't heard him say anything yet, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, filled with that love for him, and ran to his son, ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. What would it be like to have that unconditional love and acceptance running towards you, enveloping you in the strong, safe, protective arms? The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He couldn't even get the rest of the words out, right? And there's no indication what his father said. I think his father didn't say anything. He said, probably just blew right over it and said, his father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. So they celebrated. He was away. He came home to that unconditional love and acceptance. He was welcomed home, regardless of where he was, regardless of what he's done, regardless of what he looked like, regardless of what he said, regardless of his decisions, regardless of anything, he was welcomed home with that unconditional love and acceptance. And there's really two paths in this. We can choose to do that, and it's awesome, or we can choose not to do that. Let's take a look at those two paths. Curtain closes and the crowd cheers, but all you can think about is that note you didn't quite hit or that line you forgot. And you can only imagine what the critics will say and the words the crowd will murmur on their drive home. Or you walk down the hall after the big promotion. Long, hard hours have led to this handshake, but the success doesn't shake the void you feel won't be filled, and you start again to search for that thing your soul is missing. Or when you thought you'd have different news for parents about to be grand, but you must tell your mom that you miscarried again. And starting to feel like maybe you're the light that's lost, and you're beginning to question if it's you who's to blame. And you fought back tears so you could make it to mom's minivan where she gave you the cupcake intending to celebrate, but all you wanted to do was forget the day you didn't make the team or get voted class president or homecoming queen. Was it the campaign you ran, or did they just not like you? Or down the courtroom hall that feels lifetimes away from the aisle where you first said the we do's, but he didn't. And was it you or him that first gave up on this thing? Or was it just the inevitable ending from the beginning that you never saw coming? Or was it on that road that you drive every day, but that day you forget to look, and you regret every second that time stood still and any closer and she might have been killed, and somehow you start to wonder and believe you might be a failure? These paths you've been walking begin to feel like your identity, and you start to believe that maybe there's something uniquely disqualifying about you, something unfixable, maybe defective, possibly, broken, probably, unlovable, surely, not good enough, definitely, maybe you just don't deserve this. What if there was a different path? A path that felt like a home you once belonged to. A home where you don't have to hide the, oh, I'd rather not talk about that. A place where you are no longer defined by the if I could only measure up to's. What if there was a path defined by the eyes of our creator? Seeing with delight the one he created. A father who has no records of your past offenses or graph charts of how often you pray, where there's no secret agenda, no trap door, where you are not defined by self-effort. A place where you learn to trust God and trust others and allow them to love you. What if there was a place so safe you could share the worst parts of you and you would be loved more in the telling of it? What if you were welcomed home with the strength of a warm hug as you were picked up and wrapped close and told, this is home. My daughter, 
my son. Come home. If you've never had that opportunity to come home to that unconditional love and acceptance of Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. And also, if you've done that, if you've done that a long time ago, like I did, I want to give you the opportunity to move forward in living even more authentically with a few other people. Will you pray with me? Father, we just thank you so much for this awesome opportunity to be your child. And if you've not yet accepted Jesus' love, you can just pray something like this. Lord, I love you. I've done things that separated me from you. And I ask your forgiveness. I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to be your child. I want to come home. And if you have prayed that prayer, I just pray over you. And Lord, we just ask that we will take steps to be that humble, that vulnerable, that authentic with one or two other people and know that you know everything about us, right where we are, what we're doing, what we look like, what we say, who we associate, and you still love us. And let us be that brave with others so we can also experience unconditional love and acceptance here in a tangible way. We thank you for creating that opportunity. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thank you. And um, if you want to connect on anything that I've shared this morning, I'm always around Brave or the campus pastors. Know how to get a hold of me. But thank you for letting me be part of your morning. God bless and be brave. <laughs>